Good morning. We thank God for a new week and for the opportunity to hear his word this morning. My name is Nduta Malinda and I serve as a deacon here at the All Saints Cathedral, Nairobi. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for the gift of life and for the gift of a new week. We want to commit this week fully into your able hands, asking, Father, that you would continue to be with us. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word. And Lord, I ask that you'd speak to us, even as I yield myself to you. We honor you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in this month of July 2022, our overall topic is the role of Christians in politics. And our series for this week is Responsible Citizenship. Our message for today is titled Upholding the Law. To uphold means to support or to defend, to, or to defend. And law means to uh, rules and regulations. So to uphold the law is to support rules and regulations that have been set in place. In place. God created the first man, Adam, and his wife, Eve, in a perfect environment. But they both soon encountered the devil, and he deceived them into disobeying God. Here and then, sin and death were made alive. Since God knew that with the knowledge of good and evil, his people would become ungovernable, he went ahead to create laws to govern them and to help preserve them. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17, which is our main text for today, carries the Ten Commandments or the Mosaic laws, which were passed down to God's people then by his servant Moses. And I read, And God spake all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on the earth, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On, on it shall, you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in towns. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blesses, blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So these are the 10 commandments that God gave to his people through Moses. They formed part of the 613 laws that governed ancient Hebrew society. The 613 laws consisted of civil rules that governed the Israelites' day-to-day -day life, ceremonial rules that governed the worship of God in the temple, and moral rules, and that is the Ten Commandments that briefly summarized all of the Old Testament laws. These laws were given to guide God's people on how to interact with them and with, each, with him and with each other. Notice that the scriptures say that God himself and not man spoke the words in the Ten Commandments. He started by stating clearly to the Israelites who were his chosen people or nation that he was their God. And he went ahead to remind them 
that he is the one who delivered them from slavery in Egypt. This is the same God that we serve today. He is love and is with us wherever we are. He remains very interested in each and every one of our lives. He told them that he was to take first place in their lives and that he was not willing to share this position with any other God, that he would punish those who did so and it would affect subsequent generations. God pointed out that he would interpret those who serve other gods as a people who hate him and those who put him first in all in their lives as those who truly love him. He promised to bless and show love to their latter. God went on to tell his people not to use his name carelessly or in vain, and if they did, they would be guilty of sin. This included swearing by God's name and calling out his name carelessly. God expected his people to take time to rest from work, like he did when he was creating the heavens and the earth, and for them, to set some time apart to worship him without any prohibitions. God knew that without this command, his people would be incapacitated and worse still, they would probably forget him. So God commanded them to honor their parents so that they may be blessed and live long in the land. He commanded them not to murder, commit adultery, steal, give false testimonies or tell lies against their neighbors or to covet, which is to desire, crave or want anything which belongs to a neighbor. Fast forward to the New Testament where we find that God still continued to love and do wonders for his children. When he realized that his people were not able to keep the laws he had set out for them and that they were condemned to physical and spiritual death by their sins, he came up with a master plan on how to redeem them. So God outsmarted the devil by bringing down his perfect son from heaven in form of a man to die for our sins once and for all. The revelation of this truth is found in the New Testament. His son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life while here on earth, chose to die for each of our sins since, since once and for all, past, present, present, and future. We are found guiltless in him. In his perfect state, Jesus fulfilled the law and set all who believe in him, that is us Christians, free from the law as is recorded in the book of Matthew chapter five, verses 17 to 20. In Galatians chapter three, verses 23 to 26, Paul teaches that the law served as a means of revealing sin and as a prompting to faith in Jesus. The law shows us our inability to keep away from sin in our own strength, as is revealed in Romans chapter three, verses 19 to 26. So Jesus Christ did not come to abolish the law as the debate goes, but to fulfill it for our own good. Matthew chapter five, verses 17 says, that do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. One then wonders why there would even be a debate about us acknowledging and upholding the 10 commandments. To start with, are the Ten Commandments good or bad? If they are good, should we not embrace them gladly? To God, who gave these laws to his people then, the God who gave these laws to his people then is the same God that we serve today, the same loving God, and he did this out of great, great love for us so that we would avoid sin. When we get reconciled back to God, he adopts us as his sons, and we become brothers to Jesus, of Jesus Christ and core heirs of God with him. We become citizens of his kingdom. With the death of Jesus Christ and his res resurrection came reprieve from sin for all mankind. We are no longer bound by the laws found in the Old Testament. Numerous blessings are enjoyed by those who believe and are reconciled back to God. That is through Jesus Christ, his son. One of the priceless blessings is that by the grace of God and by faith, we have his laws in our hearts and they are written in our minds as well. As Hebrews 10, 16 says, this is such a wonder. And having understood what we are no, that we are no longer bound by the written laws in the Old Testament should cause us to have a heart of genuine gratitude and deep love for God. 
it should cause us to be aware of what God likes and dislikes, what is evil and good, and it should encourage us to uphold the law. The revelation of God's love for each of us should keep us from taking advantage of his grace through Jesus Christ. A reminder that Jesus Christ fulfilled that law for us should prompt us to love and to do our best to please him in every facet of our lives. As God's adopted children, we should continuously keep in mind just how very privileged we are and choose to do good at all times. In the Sunday services here at the cathedral, the summary of, the, of God's law is read out to us. And we always respond by saying, Amen. Lord, have mercy and write these laws in our hearts, we pray. The reading and response tells us clearly that the law of God still applies to us. But do we really think about response, the, our response to the law when it is read to us? Do we really mean what we say? When we say amen at the end, do we check our lifestyles against the law to see if we are truly abiding in Christ? As Christians, we have a responsibility to uphold the law. We have been reconciled back to God and therefore belong in his kingdom. When we agree and act on the law that is put in our hearts by God, we please him and we are blessed. God is depending on us to uphold the law and walk in holiness and righteousness so that we can reflect the light of Christ in a fallen world, thereby drawing souls into his kingdom. So we have established that as Christians, we have God's law which guides us through holy living in his kingdom. We also live in a nation which has laws to help govern us. So we have a responsibility to follow two sets of laws, the laws of the kingdom and the laws of our, of our land. It is sad and worrying that our nation, which has a huge percentage of Christians, continues to display lawlessness at shocking levels in the state and in the church. This can only mean that we as Christians have been unable to uphold God's law in a manner that is evident. If every Christian chose to uphold God's law, this nation would be filled with God's glory and it would be very, very evident. It follows that if we are not able to uphold the law of God, we will not be able to uphold the laws of our land either, which, nips, which, which needs to be done, is required of all citizens. When we choose to uphold God's laws, law, we will not struggle to uphold the laws of the land. There is hope for us as a nation in God, as is always the case. He is a God of love, mercy, forgiveness, and a God of a second chance. What do we need to do? We need to first and foremost repent individually and corporately for failing God in, in, in our nation and our nation, that is as Christians. Secondly, we need to commit to seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and all else will fall into place as, in, as, is, as, it, is re, is in re, as it is written in Matthew chapter six, verses 33. We are supposed to be the salt and light of our nation and the world, to be good examples of what it means to uphold the law. I put it to us again, that if we do not uphold the laws of God, as Jesus Christ did, we will not have the faith, power, and grace to uphold the laws of our land. It is therefore very clear that until and unless we begin to pay attention to God's laws, until and unless we begin to own them and meditate on them, until and unless we begin to get a revelation of the laws, of these laws, and uphold them in the true sense of the word, we will not be stirred by the spirit of the living God to act justly in our land. We need to be responsible, otherwise we will remain powerless and irrelevant as Christians or as the body of Christ in our nation. Yet God really, really wants to set a great example through us as role models for his kingdom. Let us stand to be counted in our areas of calling, be it in the marketplace, home, church, or politics. During political campaigns in our nation, the levels of evil and lawlessness tends to increase. Christians ought to be visible in this season, not in practicing lawlessness, but by setting a good example as those that uphold the law 
laws of the land. If we who are the majority act righteously, that is us Christians, there will be peace in our nation in the forthcoming elections. Let us consider our ways and check our thought processes, our speech and our actions to see if they really line up with the word of God. Let us be responsible in upholding the law of God and those of our beloved country. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for just reminding us how important it is for us to uphold your law because it still applies to us and how important it is for us to set a good example as Christians as we uphold the laws of this land. And during this time when we are going through elections, when the campaigns are on, when we are about to go to the ballot, Lord, we ask that you would help us to, be, to understand our role and to be responsible and to remain yielded to the Holy Spirit so that, Father, we may set a good example to those that are in our spheres of influence. And so, Father, we thank you and we honor you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.